You'll know that we've been in Philippians chapter 4 for a bit now, and we'll continue there. I'd invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 4. Our text for this morning will be Philippians 4 and verses 14 through 16. Working through this slowly because Paul has so much instruction to give us in this closing, in these closing words of his. And so let's start this morning by reading the text, and I'll begin in verse 10 where we were last week. Beginning in verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, now that at last you've revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you've done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, when for even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. What a wonderful portion of Scripture. And last week we saw the contentment of Paul the contentment of Paul. But this morning, we'll shift gears just a little bit to pull out a subtopic that is apparent here. But before I do that, I'd like to offer this. On May 30th of 1792, at the Friar Lane Baptist Chapel in Nottingham, England, William Carey, the shoemaker who had then turned pastor and then eventually missionary to India, preached what has become known as the deathless sermon. The simple and courageous sermon contained only two overarching points. First, expect great things from God. And secondly, attempt great things for God. And as one of Carey's descendants would go on to write about these two points, he wrote, his pair of Biddings form the right and left shoes for every pilgrim and soldier of the Lord. Just think of that for a moment. When we take a a step with our right foot, that we would first think, expect great things from the Lord, from God. And then when we take a step with our left, that we would then think, attempt great things for God. And this is the way we would journey through life. Carey's essay, An Inquiry into the Obligations of Christians to Use Means for the Conversion of the Heathens, led to the founding of the Baptist Missionary Society in October of 1792. And it was just three short months later, with a heart burning with a passion for the heathen, and yet realizing the need for financial and logistical, emotional and spiritual support, William Carey, when asked by a colleague, who will venture to the gold mine of lost souls in India, responded with this. He said, I will go down, but remember that you must hold the ropes. Now, the local church must never entertain a bare minimum requirement to be obedient to the Great Commission. Rather, her mindset always ought to be, what more can be done with what I have been given? What more can can be done with what we collectively 
have been given. And as one pastor wrote, this pastor who has also, also authored some books, he wrote this, missions is nothing less than an organized revolutionary assault on the unseen forces of, this, of the present darkness by a spiritual legion of soldiers who, fought, who fight for the extension of God's kingdom to dominate the universe. And local churches are the bastions that defend the, that cause. They forge the weapons, train the soldiers, and populate the ranks with men and women bent on spreading God's fame or dying trying. And yet we know that not everyone will go out, and some must hold the ropes for those who do. And that's, I think, the example that we see here with Philippi. The verses that we've read give us that sense. Now you'll remember from our last time, from our time last week in verses 10 through 13, that Paul, the now incarcerated and itinerant preacher and missionary, described for us a certain contentment that's characteristic of the Christian. And this was based on his own testimony of his own experiences in his, in his ministry. And Paul's contentment we saw was first appreciative, appreciative of God's providence consistently at work. And secondly, his contentment was adaptable. He could be content in whatever circumstances he faced. And then we also saw that his contentment was anchored. It was anchored in him who strengthens me, as he wrote. But in verses 14 through 20, those verses that I just continued to read on into, we could form a fourth distinctive characterizing Christian contentment. It's altruistic. It's altruistic, meaning that there's an unselfish regard for the welfare of others. Uh, it's selflessly, it selflessly desires to benefit or bring advantage to others. And I think this is Paul's example as well, the example of his contentment, which isn't surprising, right? It shouldn't surprise us that we would see that there. Try being content by living for yourself. It just doesn't work. You'll never gain it. But Paul's closing words offer us another focal point here. And that's what I'd like to delve into a little bit this morning. We see with detail the intrinsic nature of the Philippians giving because he describes it for us here. And so we'll see in these three verses, verses 14 through 16, that Paul provides his readers with five characteristics of the nature of Christian giving so that we can participate together with others effectively in gospel ministry. This is what he describes of the Philippians. So that's five characteristics of the nature of Christian giving so that you can participate together with others more effectively in gospel ministry. And so first, let's take a look at the nature of Christian giving, and that, that first characteristic would be that it's commendable, that it's commendable. There will be five of them, as I've already said. First, we'll look at the commendable nature of giving, then the caring nature of giving, then the concerted nature of giving, then the complementary nature of giving, and finally, the continually cautious nature of giving. So first of all, in verse 14, the commendable nature of giving. Take a look at the text again. Verse 14. Nevertheless, you have done well to share, Paul writes. And Paul draws for us here another contrast for the Philippians to consider further. Nevertheless, could be understood as on the other hand, or even so, or, or yet. And so Paul doesn't want to leave the wrong impression with the Philippians. Yes, he was contented in every one of his circumstances, even without their gift. Even so, he is emphasizing something very important here for the Philippians, and he's wanting to affirm the Philippian church's personal care and concern for him. And this, based on the evidences we will see. And so, there's a commendation. You have done well, 
Philippians, you have reached the high water, high level water mark in your conduct, in your consideration for me. You have done so finely. You have done so rightly. You've executed this beautifully. But what exactly have the Philippians performed so nobly, so splendidly? What have they done? Well, Paul says that they have shared. You have done well to share. And this word in the Greek really is familiar to us already. Sug koinoneo is the, the term that he uses here, and you have heard the, the term koinos in there, right? Koinos is fellowship or partnership or sharing. And here he uses the term sug koinoneo. Now, koinos means to enter into communion or fellowship with one another by joining oneself to an associate, to make oneself a sharer or a partner in a common interest. And so there's a sympathetic connection that is taking place here that's being described. Now, sug koinoneo is a compound word, and you'll hear that prefix sug on there, And really what he's doing there is he's added a prefix to the front of the word that we know as fellowship. And that prefix, that that preposition means together with. Now, if you think of it, if you think of it, if if we've already talked about sharing or participation, there there is a connection there. And yet he adds this preposition that means together with fellowship or together with partner to really add emphasis. It's a little bit redundant, but it's purposefully done so, so that he's really emphasizing the, this, this partnership. The Philippians' gift is a clear sign of their solidarity with Paul in his gospel ministry, and it displays a, a mutuality in all that comes with Paul's gospel mem- ministry. You'll remember that early in Paul's letter, He wrote in chapter 1 and verse 5, where Paul was thanking God in view of their koinia, their participation in the gospel from the first day until now. A fellowship entered into even as the very first converts were made in Philippi, as those first uh, testimonies of God's saving grace became apparent. But then again, in chapter 1 and verse 9, we see Paul write, For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all sug quineos, is what he writes here. Partakers of grace with me. And so there's that very same term that he's using now in chapter 4 and verse 14. They're sharing both in Paul's suffering while he's imprisoned and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. This is, this is how we should understand the Philippians as they are partaking together with Paul in his ministry. Then again, in chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any koinea, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion. And here we see him describing that common life that they were living together with him, united in one spirit, even as they were being called that uh, by way of reminder here again by Paul. And then in chapter 3 and verse 10, he writes, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the koineon, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. And theirs also was a mutual participation in suffering. As Paul suffered in languished in, in prison, certainly these partners in ministry felt that in the very core of their beings. As he was suffering, they too suffered, and ultimately suffering for the sake of Christ and being willing to do so. We know that in chapter 1 and verse 29, Paul wrote, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And as Paul suffered, so did the Philippians suffer together with him for the sake of Christ. 
It was a faithful participation in Paul's ministry, which is certainly noble on the part of the Philippians. And Paul is confident. He's confident that these Philippians share fully in the gospel, in his gospel-centered pursuits, and in his interests. And so he writes, you have done well to share with me. This is the first characteristic of the nature of Christian giving, that it is commendable. But then secondly, he describes this caring nature as well. It's undergirded with care. And so take a look again at verse 14. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. Under what circumstances did the Philippians share with Paul? Well, Paul gives us the answer there. It's in his affliction, in my affliction. And this term that Paul uses here literally means pressure. That he, there's a, a literal pressure that he was under. But here he's using it metaphorically to describe that oppression, that tribulation, the distress that he faced consistently in gospel ministry and more specifically, currently, as he continues to, to sit in house arrest. And the Philippians have shown interest in Paul's affliction, both now and even previously. We heard of some of Paul's afflictions last week, right? There were the, the beatings at the hands of the chief magistrates in Acts chapter 16 that we read about. And then subsequently shackled and placed in jail enduring unjust treatment, even despite the fact that he himself was a Roman citizen and should have never had gone through that. Then he was run out of Thessalonica by this angry mob of jealous Jews and wicked men. The same mob then follows them to Berea and, and pushes them ultimately out of Macedonia altogether. He certainly faced turbulent times. In 2 Corinthians 11 and Beginning in verse 23, we read of the, the hardships that Paul faced. He describes labors, imprisonments, beaten, times without number, often in danger of death, five times receiving 39 lashes, three times beaten with rods, once stoned, three times shipwrecked, a night and a day spent in the deep, on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from his countrymen, Dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren, in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And then there was the daily pressure that he had for the concern that he had for all the churches. And so certainly he faced much affliction over the course of his ministry but presently, he's under house arrest. He's in this, his own rented house in, in Rome where he boldly and without hindrance continues to preach the kingdom of God and teach concerning the Lord Jesus Christ to whomever will come and visit him. We get that from Acts 28 and verses 30 and 31. All the while receiving care and provision from the likes of the Philippians, through Epaphroditus and his short-term ministry that we learned about in chapter 2, as we went through chapter 2. And so Paul here provides a, a ministry support, uh, or a ministry report, I should say. He provides a ministry report in chapter 1 and verses 12 through 14. He describes this this Roman imprisonment. He says, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. It's always about the gospel for Paul. He goes on to say, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ will become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. This is the ministry in which the Philippians share a partnership for the sake of the gospel. And Grace Life, you do well to share in the ministries of 
those who also go forth and proclaim the gospel, as did our Colombian short-term ministry team. Now, only eight went, right? Only eight went. But many of you, so many of you, gave commendably and caringly toward this effort to lend encouragement to the Morales family and to the local church that they're serving in for the sake of the gospel. And you continue to give in that regard. And then there's, you know, if, if we kind of shift gears here a little bit, and even if we think back to the time when our local body here experienced the season of affliction, we received support from all over the world during our affliction. And even financial support in the event that, that we would need it in the courts. And at the same time, I think we had many Epaphroditus come through our doors from other churches to visit and greatly encourage us as well in that time. And so we see that there's this economy at work and Christian giving is commendable. It's caring in the face of affliction sharing people and financial resources that are suitable to the circumstances that others find themselves in. And all of this in order to hold the rope. And so those are the first two points here, the first two characteristics of the nature of Christian giving. First, it's commendable. Second, it's caring by nature. Now, thirdly, it's a concerted effort. And we see this in verse 15, in the beginning of verse 15. You yourselves know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, Paul writes. Now this is significant, and we shouldn't miss this, that Paul is acknowledging certain key facts here, which, as he says, the Philippians already are well aware of themselves. It's as if he's saying, you already know as well as I do. These two facts come in the form of timestamps, marking the church's faithful participation. First notice, at the first preaching of the gospel, literally from the beginning of the gospel is the way we would render it from the Greek. From the beginning of the proclamation of the good news, from the point of hearing Paul proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And we see this in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, you can turn there, certainly. In Acts chapter 16, we we see Paul and Silas land in Philippi. This is a leading city in the district of Macedonia. It's also described by Paul as a, or by Luke rather, as a Roman colony. And beginning in verse 13, we read, On the Sabbath day, we went outside to the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken By Paul, there's the gospel. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. What has just happened here? What has just happened here, friends? Heart regeneration with immediate results. Evidence of gospel transformation, there's an immediate partnership that occurs here. Lydia is sensitive immediately to Paul's needs, and immediately they have a place to stay. And this remained the pattern of the Philippians. How do we know that? Well, turn to 2 Corinthians in chapter 8. Paul describes, in part, the Philippians' participation in his ministry, even as he moves on to Corinth. 
We see beginning in verse one, he writes, now brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. That includes Philippi. That in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord begging us which, with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they get, first gave of themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. And so here too, we see the character of the giving that was coming from Philippi. It was by God's grace. It was amidst affliction. It was done joyfully. Their poverty not preventing them in any way. They gave freely, sacrificially, willingly, voluntarily. And then a few chapters later, you could turn there to chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. We see the impact that this had on Paul's ministry. And when I was present with you, and I, this, is chap, this is verse 9 now, 2 Corinthians eleven nine. 9, and when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone, for when the brethren came from Macedonia, they supplied, they fully supplied my need. And in everything, I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. And so there comes a gift from Macedonia, and this is a, ministry impacting gifts, which Luke then chronicles in Acts chapter 18 for us. You can turn there. Luke chronicles Paul's claim here in Acts chapter 18. Now in Acts chapter 18, we see Paul having left Macedonia and entering into the district of Achaia. Now preaching the gospel in Athens, he went to Corinth after that staying and working with Aquila and Priscilla. These were Jewish tent makers by trade. And that was Paul's wheelhouse as well. But we pick up the text in verse four. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greek, Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. You see, prior, he had to, he had continued to work, right, to earn a living until Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, came down from Philippi with a gift that allowed Paul then to set tent making aside and focus solely on the gospel. That's what we can deduce here. Paul was able to commit himself wholeheartedly to gospel proclamation because now his needs were being met. These were recognized needs. Now, why did Paul need to work in Corinth? I think that's a fair question to ask here too. Okay, We've been focused on the church of Philippi here and, and their actions, but we need to also consider why was it in the first place that Paul needed to work in Corinth? I would submit to you that it was probably due to the state of the church in Corinth. You see, Corinth was strongly influenced by its immoral context. It was divided in its fellowship, and it was very chaotic in its worship. And this unlike the church in Philippi. And so Philippi could commit their time and their energies to supporting Paul's gospel ministry, while on the other hand, things just were not prepared in that way in Corinth. We get a strong sense then of the concerted effort of the Philippians to support Paul. This was something that was mutually contrived, agreed upon, and executed by way of a unified collective. But we see here also that, that it needs, and it needs to be said, Concerted giving is not intuitive, right? Concerted giving is not intuitive. We see that in Corinth, right? That's the case of Corinth. Paul had to continue working. 
In fact, he goes on to write here, and I'll ask you to turn back to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 15. Now in the middle of verse 15, Paul states, no church shared with me. No church literally fellowshiped with me, as the LSB renders it. And this, this term here, this verb, is ekkoinonesin. Okay, and there again, we hear that koineso, uh, the koineo term. All other churches were not sharing. They were not participating in, in Paul's gospel ministry. In fact, they had failed to help Paul, likely failing to, to fulfill a gospel obligation that they have. And from this, if one fails to help in gospel ministry, if one fails to carry out a gospel obligation that each one of us has, then it can be easily concluded that there's also a failing of receiving the blessings that are found within that fellowship, within that participation that's taking place. And so really, we see then here the unique nature of the Philippians' partnership with Paul. Again, giving is not intuitive necessarily. And so we see a very concerted effort on the part of the the Philippians. Now, how can we apply this? How can this be applied to us? Well, maybe by way of a few questions. Are you missing out on the opportunities that are presented to you to participate more directly in the gospel ministry of others? And by giving specifically, by giving of what God has given to you toward those gospel ministries? Do you recognize your gospel obligation? Or are you ignoring your gospel obligation? Are you missing out then also on the blessings that could be had otherwise, right? By participating. Certainly, certainly the Philippians were rich for their participation. We'll see that in just a moment here. And so giving is a concerted, it's a collaborative effort. Or we could ask this, have you assessed the extent of your sharing in the ministries of Grace Life's missionaries? We could ask that as well. We support some wonderful men in the field who have devoted their lives to to proclaim the gospel, to train up pastors in other countries, to faithfully pastor in churches. Are you doing all that you possibly can in order to come alongside them, to lock arms together with them, and to to partner with them, to partner with Sean in Manila in the Philippines, with Hovig in Yerevan in Armenia, with Ricardo in Bogota, Colombia, with David in a place that I can't even pronounce, but I know it's in Madagascar, right? These places are outside of the scope of our understanding even, but there's an easy way to come alongside. And that's by giving. And yet, I know at the same time that there are some here that likely entertain thoughts of just meeting the bare minimum. The bare minimum requirement to to in some way participate in the Great Commission, whatever that even might be in your mind. I'm not exactly sure. But giving is a concerted team effort. While participating, while participating in this, we need to remember to wear those shoes. Remember those shoes, right? Right foot, expect great things from God. Then left foot, attempt great things for God. And this is the way we walk. This is the way we walk. And so that's a concerted effort. Now, fourthly, giving is complementary. Christian Christian giving is complementary. Now, we see this in verse 15. I'd ask you to train your eyes down the text again. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. Now, what does Paul mean here by the matter of giving and receiving? This is language that Paul uses here. It describes a business relationship in the ancient world, 
is really what's being described here. And as one commentator explains, matter refers to an account used in business transactions. This according to Greek literature. And giving and receiving are monetary transactions on two sides of a ledger, okay? So there's giving on one side and receiving on the other. And yes, technically, we know that this is a financial gift that has been get both given and then received. That's what, what Paul is describing here. But there's also the sense that the giving and receiving extends into the act of service to one another. Also, the ongoing mutual communication while enjoying this close partnership, which really is a very close friendship. We know that the Philippians gave generously to Paul and his gospel ministry. But why did they give? Why did they give? Well, it was in direct response to what they had received, right? It was in direct response really to that heart, <clears throat> excuse me, that heart change that they experienced, right? We saw it in Lydia. Excuse me. We saw it in Lydia's life, certainly, but then we also saw it in the lives of others as they came under the gospel, transformed lives. They continued to seek Paul out to give. They were concerned about him. So this was in direct response to what they had received from Paul. Both the gospel message, this, <clears throat> and not only the gospel message, but also Paul's very life. You'll remember in chapter 2 and verse 17, he wrote, even if poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of their faith. And this is his own life that he is describing here. So they received both, or they were given both the gospel and Paul gave his life to them. This is then what they also received, right? And we saw Paul's life described even in chapter four and verse nine, where he describes whatever you learned, whatever you received, whatever you heard and seen in me, right? This was the model, the example of his life that they had, that they had witnessed and that he had clearly given to them. So there's a reciprocal relationship between Paul and the Philippians that's presented here. And that helps us to see the nature of giving as complementary, complementary. But then, and it's no stretch to say this either, giving and receiving here really serves as a metaphor for us then to look even beyond to a, on a much grander scale. As we look to the generosity of God placed on vivid display through the gospel of his son. A gospel summarized by Paul in another portion of a scripture focused on giving. We see this in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, where he writes, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. It's a one-verse gospel right there. And as my, one of my pastors in California said, that's a, that is a rich Christmas text. A rich Christmas text. All about giving. All about a gift. And we see that he was rich. Him existing in the form of God and being equal with God, and yet we know he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. This is Christ being described as becoming poor. Jesus, by his perfect life then becomes that perfect sacrifice for sin and his death to satisfy God's wrath over sin. His resurrection proof that the power of sin and death are ultimately defeated. 
And so now if you would repent of your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ on the basis of that finished work and that finished work alone, then you too would realize the love that God has demonstrated in sending his son to the save for the salvation of sinners. And then if you say, I've been given much, so then what will I give in return? We see that again. There's something complementary that occurs here. And so giving is complementary. Christian giving is complementary. Now finally, and fifthly, Christian giving is continually conscious, and that we can pick up from verse 16. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Now based on the verses that we've already looked at, the church in Philippi seems to be that preeminent church, really, in Macedonia. Preeminent in their giving. They were outstanding contributors to Paul's gospel ministry. And Paul's time in Thessalonica bears witness to this because it was an extremely turbulent time in his, in his life. The Philippians remained well aware of all that was occurring there. We see, we read about this even in, in 1, Thessalonian, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul's labors and hardships are described, how he worked day and night so as not to be a burden to any of them while ministering the gospel. And the Philippians were certainly aware of, of those unruly, those undisciplined, the out-of-work busybodies that were relentlessly hounding Paul and Silas as they were trying to minister in Thessalonica for a time. And so what do they do? They send for Paul and, and Silas' needs not only once, but more than once to meet those very needs. And as we saw last week, as we read in chapter 4 and verse 10, the Philippians were continually concerned. Paul was continually on their, mind and on their minds, and even when they lacked opportunity in certain moments to send gifts to him, as soon as they got the opportunity, they sent Epaphroditus with a financial gift. And not only a financial gift, but a brother that would come alongside and minister to his needs as he continued to um, be under house arrest. And so they remained conscious of Paul's ongoing needs and repeatedly gave. And this is a challenge then to us. Are we conscious of the needs, the gospel needs of others? Are we conscious of this? Are we ensuring that we're, we're asking around to, to, to make sure that we know? We could even be sending letters to our missionaries, emails, asking them how they're, how they're doing. Pastor Brad you know, is in regular contact with them. You could be reaching out even more simply to our own pastor, Pastor Brad, and he could tell you of the needs, the current needs in each one of those places. And then certainly, it's just a small step to, to go, I, I, can, I can give support to that. I can give toward that effort. I recognize the need, and I'm going to, I'm going to jump on that. Right? For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. And this needs to be the pattern here at Grace Life. Learning to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that we will not be unfruitful, as Paul writes in Titus 3.14. And so there we've seen it. We've seen six characteristics of the nature of Christian giving. And we've seen this in order that each one of you can effectively participate together with others already in gospel ministry for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of of drawing souls to Christ and so that you can hold the rope for others as they go out. Giving is commendable. Giving displays care. Giving is a concerted effort, as we've seen. 
Giving is certainly complementary with giving and receiving being reciprocal. And giving should remain continually conscious. It should be at the forefront of our minds continually. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for the instruction here and for the exhortation that we can draw out of your word. How there is a a charge that comes alongside the Great Commission that not, not only would we be evangelizing, but that we would be supporting others, even financially, as they go out into the world, as they go out into all areas, even to unreached people groups, and that we would be eager, as we've seen with the Philippians, that we would be conscious, that we would be alert and aware of what's going on in our world, specifically with those who we support, those who we send out. And we thank you for this opportunity because we know that within it, there is blessing. And so, Father, we pray that you would enable us in areas that, that need addressing to, to be more generous, to, to give more effectively in order to participate more fully with the gospel as it goes forth from the mouths of others. We thank you for this, this morning and this time. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.